Welcome to video four. In this final video, we're going to talk a bit about unproven features, 11AX's biggest challenges, and of course, when to upgrade. We'll go ahead and start with unproven features. There are several of these, as we're gonna see on the next slide, and um, it's not that these are necessarily good or bad, it's just that we don't know yet uh, what impact they may have, or even if, uh, if these, some of these features will come to market in the chipsets. Multi-user MIMO has been around for some time with 11AX. First, let's talk about BSS coloring. This one, again, we have high hopes for this. And what is this exactly? Well, it's called both BSS color or BSS coloring, and it's an 11AX only method for identifying and dealing with overlapping basic service sets. That is co-channel interference or co-channel contention or just contention. This is a uh, method of virtualizing a channel so that um, if we can add a, a unique identifier to a basic service set, uh, let's say identifier number one, then even though we may be using the same channel in another AP, in another basic service set, if it had an identifier of number two, then those would not be considering as overlapping in many cases. Instead of talking about these numerical values, we like to talk of it in, in uh, terms of color. So those values, those numerical values are called colors. It's kind of a nickname, if you will, okay? So you can see in the graphic here, we've got these uh, channel plans, these four channel plans, uh, black, green, yellow, gray, purple, and so on. And the idea of BSS coloring, the hope, is that 36 black and 36 green would not interfere with each other and then 36 black and 36 yellow would not interfere, and 36 green and yellow would not interfere, and so on. But only 36 black and 36 black would interfere. Now, in the real world, these again, these colors are numbers, and we will see those, if you're looking at a scanner, you might be able to see the, uh, for example, the color, and see, even though this AP is using 36 uh, with a color of one, uh, the, the other AP that you can hear is 36 with a color of 2. Those would not normally cause each other interference. There are cases where they could, but they, they usually would not. Now that's, that's the goal here. And of course, if they're not interfering with each other, that means we can have simultaneous transmissions on the same channel uh, between systems using different colors. So this is a way of reusing the same channels over and over again up to 63 different times. So it's... It's like taking your 25 channels and multiplying them by 64, uh, you know, uh, with identifiers of 1 through 63. So this is, this is quite nice um, for virtualization of channels. Now, the, the BSS color values communicated both at the physical and MAC layers. It's in the physical header. It's in, the Mac, in MAC headers of certain, um, uh, certain frames. And of course, the, the channel access behavior is going to be dependent on the color detected. If you detect something with your own color on your channel, then that's uh, interference. If you could detect something with a different color, that would not be normally considered interference. There's some thresholds involved to say whether it is or is not interference, but in, in uh, all likelihood, it would not be. We'll see how these thresholds work in just a moment. So BSS coloring was introduced in the 802.11ah amendment to assign uh, each BSS a color, this numerical uh, differentiator, this method of uh, virtualizing channels, if you will. And the purpose here is increasing capacity in dense client environments. It's increasing the channel reuse. Um, and so that eliminates a lot of the co-channel interference. This also gives the possibility of using wider channels which yield higher data rates uh, in high density environments. If we can virtualize a channel many ways and have uh, CCA threshold settings dynamically being adjusted carefully and accurately, then this, this actually could enable 40 megahertz channels or maybe even 80s uh, in, in high density environments. This, this could allow for much, much higher reuse and higher throughput per client, per system, and so on. Again, this is an unproven feature. We certainly hope it works. We have high hopes for it, but it's not known yet whether this is going to give us the benefit that uh, the marketing of it promises. Keep in mind, though, that uh, BSS coloring is only understood by 11AX clients and APs. 
So any legacy, 11AC, N, and so on, um, will not understand the, the color values. So they would just see channel 36 and channel 36, not channel 36 blue and channel 36 red. To dig a little deeper into this concept of coloring, we have to understand the difference between intra-BSS and inter-BSS. When a, um, let's say a client is associated to an access point that is uh, uh, channel 36 blue, and it hears another transmission on 36 blue, then uh, that is channel 36 with the same numerical identifier, it will consider this to be intra-BSS. That, therefore, it would uh, cause it to back off. It would uh, defer. And so this would be contention. But if it were to be associated to 36 blue and it, it would hear 36 red, that is something else transmitting on channel 36 with, uh, with a different uh, color identifier of red, then that would not be considered contention. And, and it would uh, usually allow this a client to go ahead and transmit. And the same, of course, applies to APs. So we call that inter-BSS, whereby the colors um, that it hears is different than its own. And when I say a receiver hears a color, I simply mean a transmission that has a specific marking in the phi header. Okay. So APs and clients will apply adaptive uh, clear channel assessment thresholds uh, to enable spatial reuse. Uh, their signal detect threshold can be dynamic while their energy detect thresholds may remain static. And we're going to see how that works in the next couple of slides. Referring to the chart on the right, before in, um, having the, the intra-BSS and inter-BSS with coloring, we, we had no color matching in the flow chart, the logic flow chart. But here you can see that when it detects a transmission uh, on its own channel, it's going to first check the color and see if it's, if it's the same color or a different color before making a decision as to whether the medium is busy or idle. If, for example, a station that is an AP or a client, here's a frame that, that's considered inter-BSS, meaning it has a different color. The station is going to uh, treat the medium as busy only during the time it takes that this, uh, for the station to validate that the frame is actually from an overlapping basic service set, meaning an inter-BSS frame. The signal detect threshold, that is the level of signal that is required to cause back off, can be adjusted. We call this an adaptive CCA or clear channel assessment uh, for the inner BSS frames while maintaining standard threshold for the intra BSS frames, which is typically around 4 dB SNR. The whole purpose of this is cutting down on contention and therefore allowing for more simultaneous transmissions, higher efficiency, and higher system wide and client throughput. We don't yet know the real world effects of an adaptive CCA algorithm that, that we'll find in uh, 11AX systems, uh, whether first gen or second gen, we expect first gen chipsets to have this, but we don't know how well this is gonna work. We can base some judgment here of this feature, the ability for an AP to make these decisions on current uh, use of manually adjusted receive sensitivity and access points. So we know that when we manually adjust the sensitivity on APs and we get it just right, it's, it's optimal, we can get a pretty significant positive impact, meaning we get better channel reuse uh, and less contention. We also know if it's suboptimally adjusted that it can be a complete train wreck. It can um, cause a tremendous co-channel interference and uh, back off and low throughput. So really the quality of whether this is going to work, this. Um, uh, the BSS coloring along with adaptive CCAs is going to depend on the algorithm uh, and how well this algorithm works. So higher clear channel assessment for the signal detect uh, value is going to lead to more simultaneous transmissions, but it potentially lowers your, your signal to interference noise ratio. Uh, the goal here is to increase your channel reuse uh, while not causing significant reduction in your, your data rate, your MCS. Um, we think that the adaptive CCA is going to be tied to transmit power control, but that's yet to be seen. If you look at the graphic on the right, you can see that our CCASD, that is the signal detect threshold, is typically around, statistically around 4 dB SNR. 
Um, that's a little squiggly line there, about 4 dB SNR. But that can be dynamically adjusted uh, for overlapping basic services. That is, inter, um, inter BSSs, so that uh, we can essentially desensitize our receiver to them, ignore them, and transmit over the top of them, and uh, without creating uh, a contention scenario. And that's the benefit here of BSS coloring with adaptive CCA. Let's take one more um, look at this and see uh, how this works. You can see on the left we have the intra BSS and if we had a noise floor, this, this is just an example, if we had a noise floor of negative 100 and we've done that just to make the numbers easy and we've got a 4 dB SNR um, up to a neg 96 SD threshold, that is signal detect threshold, that would be static. There's no changing that. And then, then we have on the right side, inter BSS. And you'll see how in a second, the signal detect threshold can be changed by the access point to, um, to desensitize uh, itself to, to anything that is on the same channel, but marked with a different color, okay? You can see how we, we could dynamically move this up to an example of, let's say, from NEG96 to NEG83, or maybe, uh, maybe NEG85, or whatever uh, it needs to be on a frame-by-frame -frame or moment-by-moment uh, -moment, uh, basis. Um, and this, this desensitization like this will uh, cause us to be able to transmit over the top of nearby other transmitters on the same channel using a different color. Another 11AX uh, feature that has been uh, borrowed from 11AH is uh, the target wake time, TWT. This is a power saving uh, feature that allows client devices to sleep for long periods of time. There's the um, negotiated policies between APs and clients uh, that are based on expected traffic activity uh, that will allow uh, specified wake up times per client and per flow up to eight flows. So this is gonna allow the AP to control the amount of contention and reduce battery consumption because clients are sleeping for longer periods of time by scheduling uh, traffic at specific points in time. And of course, allowing for extended sleep or low power states. Also a component of TWT is um, non-negotiated, what we call broadcast TWT, whereby all the clients awake simultaneously to get broadcast or multicast and things like this. TWT uh, was uh, brought in 11AH uh, for the purpose of supporting IoT and small battery-like devices. So clients can sleep for hours without dropping association, but there are ramifications to that. For example, you may need to assign static APs because DHCP lease times may be exceeded uh, by the sleep times. And you wouldn't want clients to wake up and find that they have no IP address or they have an overlapping IP with somebody else. Okay. The AP may protect its client transmissions with a CTS um, uh, at the client's scheduled transmit time. So the client's supposed to, to wake up and transmit. So what would happen then is the AP would transmit the CTS to protect or to shut down everybody else, allowing the cl client to come up and immediately transmit, transmit rather than having to uh, you know, transmit, not get an acknowledgement, back off, back off and keep, you know, and that would burn power. So in, essentially it's protecting that client's uh, ability uh, to get that transmit uplink. Another nice uh, component of TWT is the AP can send an NDP, that is a null data packet, to a client at, at its, uh, uh, when it wakes up uh, that, can, that contains the buffer status. So since the client would know the AP's buffer status, the client can then send a PS poll to get its you know, frame. So it'd be PS poll ACK data ACK or PS poll data ACK as normal using legacy power save. But it's just uh, simply you know, using a null data packet and indicating in the quas control uh, how much buffer is in the AP is a qu very quick way to indicate to a, to a low power client like this uh, how many frames are in the queue. With preamble puncturing, which again is uh, another feature that we, we simply haven't uh, been able to prove yet, we have a scenario here drawn at the bottom where we have an 11AX AP uh, with a, an 80 megahertz wide channel. 
and we have a, a neighbor using, let's say, for just as an example, channel 56, a 20 megahertz wide channel. And we can detect that. And so uh, when we're um, uh, looking at signal detect and we decide that since uh, 56 is busy, and we could do this with uh, an RTS-CTS exchange across all four of the 20 meg channels or what have you. But instead of uh, it coming back like dynamic channel widths where we it comes back and we're missing a, C, uh, um, a CTS from an RTS-CTS exchange, and then we might have to limit it to a 20 meg transmission, we can go ahead and transmit around the busy channel using preamble puncturing. So it's a bit more efficient way than dynamic channel widths of using as much spectrum as possible if we're going to use wide channels with 11AX. Uh, I see this feature as being especially good for homes and small businesses with uh, with nearby ac uh, legacy access points. I see this being a big deal, especially since you'll have a lot of 11AC clients wanting to do wide transmissions uh, quite a bit, and you want to get as as much throughput as you possibly can. Okay, but once you're really driving toward efficiency, you're in high density. You're typically going to be using 20 meg channels anyway, and so this would probably not apply in a lot of cases. Keep in mind that for a preamble puncturing to work, the AP and the client have to be able to support that. So legacy clients would not uh, not be able to take advantage of this. It's also important to note that uh, when you're using 80 mag or 160 mag channels, probably wouldn't be using 160s, but uh, you know we, we do use 80s from time to time, depending on scenario, um, that you can only puncture secondary channels. You can't puncture your primary. Primary is a, a required portion. This, uh, this capability of preamble puncturing is uh, it's an optional capability within 11AX and again we just don't know how well this is going to work or if we're even going to use it. We may or may not have this feature in some chipsets and some vendors APs. What are some of the biggest challenges for 11AX? There are uh, a lot of them but uh, certainly, uh, we'll see on the next slide some of the, the more um, uh, obvious ones. My my biggest one is the hype and misinformation in the market. I think this is a, a big challenge for 11AX. The expectations will be set too high uh, by a lot of um, a misunderstanding of the technology, mismarketing by those who would do so. And, uh, and here's some of the things you'll hear. 11AX is like a switch. It simply isn't. It's still half duplex. The EDCA um, operating procedure still applies. Uh, it's just that during a tick up we see uh, more efficiency through determinism and the AP can control a certain number of 11AX clients at a given time and how much throughput they get. So there's, there's added efficiency, there's added determinism, but it's nowhere near like a switch. Another, 11AX will give us four times as much throughput. Well, it may if you have a greenfield environment, uh, four times as much per client throughput. That's its target. And of course, that may, um, may translate into four times as much uh, aggregate system capacity, and that's great. But that's if you have a purely 11AX greenfield environment. And that's still, it's a target, not a promise. So, uh, so in the early days of 11AX implementation, uh, it certainly will not give you that. Next, 11AX will require 2.5 gig or more Ethernet uh, backhaul, like 5 gig ports or dual 2.5 or dual 5. That's just bad math, or as uh, a lot of the European countries say, bad maths. So um, it certainly is. We talked about how channels will um, saturate between 30 and 65 meg for most environments because the clients are one by one to two by two, and there's a mix of those. So it's only when you have very low contention with a you know a three by three client right by itself that you're going to be able to even get close to a gig, and it would have to be all UDP, perfectly clean environment, 80 meg channel, um, very fast a high end AP, all of the above has to be just right, and and uh, a single file copy to an extremely fast NAS um, and so on uh, to even reach one gig. But certainly anything higher than that is not possible. Another is the benefit of multi-user MIMO will finally be realized. There's no chance of that. Multi-user MIMO has very, very high channel uh, sounding overhead uh, in the downlink. And even in the downlink with a maximum of three, we've realized almost no benefit in most cases. 
The real uh, use case for multi-user MIMO is in a home with set-top boxes where you've got uh, devices that support it that do not move. There's a minimal number of devices like three or four uh, that are within range of the access point or wireless router and um, and the sounding is minimal but when you get into a high number of clients that support this the channel sounding becomes very very high and the algorithm uh, or algorithms for uh, determining which clients to transmit to at a given time and trying to get two or three in a group is very very difficult and so we usually just turn this feature off in most systems it's just a, a bunch of overhead with no return an uplink MIMO will be worse than downlink MIMO for sure. Uh, there's almost no chance of that giving us any real benefit. The AP uh, completely controls the medium. It simply does not. Uh, it controls the medium only during a tick sop, and, and of course it wins as many tick sops as it wins based on the you know how much competition it has uh, in the, the channel. Another is 11AX will revolutionize your business. That's very unlikely. This, while it is a nice step forward in efficiency, it, and it certainly will as we move toward 11AX clients, uh, client populations go up, uh, it's going to give us more efficiency, increase system-wide throughput and per client throughput. But uh, this is not a game-changing technology. It is a very technical uh, very complex technology that will give us incremental gain. And that incremental gain is, um, is so because we still have legacy clients and will have for some time to come. Another big one, 11AX remedies all of the problems of previous FIs. It simply does not. Uh, because all those previous FIs are still in play and 11AX has to be backwards compatible. And finally, 11AX solves the 2.4 gig crowding problem. Uh, it, it doesn't. The, the, the 802.11b, G, and N clients in 2.4 will still be there. The interference sources will still be there. They're going nowhere, and there are tens of billions of them in, in the world. So uh, what it does give you is increased efficiency on, on the band that you're using it on, on the channel that you're using it on, that 11AX clients can take advantage of. What are some of the technical challenges? Well, poor quality client devices that distort the RUs of neighboring users. Now that's something you might not have thought of to begin with. If the amplifiers uh, and the radios on the client devices are of such poor quality and they're assigned a, let's say for example, a 26 tone RU, and yet they're not able to uh, Con, you know, concisely confine their transmission to that 26 tones. Uh, they've got uh, overlap into neighboring tones that could distort or corrupt transmissions from the neighboring clients, especially if they're close to those neighboring clients. So that's certainly an issue. Uh, how would we solve that? Well, we would vet and purchase high quality client devices with good drivers and standard support uh, is the first and foremost thing. Another challenge, technical challenge, is poor 11AX or previous designs, deployments, and validations. This is no different than before um, with 11AC and 11N. A good design uh, is vital and validating that and deploying according to the design and validating that design and deployment is absolutely imperative to a good performance. And of course, uh, performance part of that is efficiency. So what do we do? We design the infrastructure with the client devices and application performance requirements in mind. We meet the customer's requirements and constraints and we validate that. Design, 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 and then validate, validate, validate. Very important. The next is legacy client upgrades to 11AX clients are going to be slow. Uh, now, of course, you know, manufacturers love to talk about, no, it'll be, you know, record speed. We'll have all 11AX clients in the market within a year. That's just not true. Uh, the existing, you know, tens of billions of client devices are not going anywhere. They're being taken out of the market very slowly. We still have 11B clients in the market today. In fact, there are 11B chipsets still being manufactured today, which is kind of crazy if you ask me, but it's for IoT and such as that, where they don't need much throughput and they can make these chipsets very, very cheaply. It takes roughly 25 years to get a physical layer out of the market. I mean, uh, 11A and 11B were introduced in 1999. So 1999, here it is, 2018. So we can expect 11B to still be out there, 11A to still be out there for a few more years to come. So um, we're gonna continue to have legacy clients for a long time and people will still be selling 11AC uh, clients for a long time after 11AX is introduced. 
So it's going to take quite some time to upgrade to a near Greenfield 11AX deployment for clients. Now, in 11, now when do we want to upgrade to an 11AX infrastructure? This is an important question. There's a lot to consider here. Uh, I tried in, in this, uh, uh, the next slide here to, uh, to present this from, not from a marketing perspective, for, but from the user's perspective, from the real world perspective. Let's see what those are. So when should I upgrade to that 11AX infrastructure? Sometimes to upgrade. If you have 11A, B, G, or N infrastructure, definitely upgrade. Your stuff is old. Um, 11N can still perform quite well in, in many environments, but it's probably uh, out of support, uh, no code up updates coming, uh, no feature updates coming, not supported or end of sale, end of life, things like this. So uh, certainly if you have a physical layer that old, um, it's time to upgrade. If your 11AC network has reached its end of sale, end of life, end of support, um, those are key indicators that it's time uh, to upgrade. Maybe you've got a first generation 11AC um, and it's, uh, it's no longer being supported, no code updates, no bug fixes, uh, things like this. Uh, it may be time to consider 11AX infrastructure. If you have a budget that requires spending, um, spend it on something that has a longer lifetime. Even though 11AC is still out there, 11AX is newer. It's going to be supported for longer, have code updates for longer, have warranties for longer, and things like this. So if you're required to spend your budget, uh, certainly consider 11AX. Um, it's, the, it's the next newest thing. Of course, if there, there are bugs, and there may be some bugs early on um, in various you know, vendors' APs, they have an obligation to their customer base to fix those. If you're missing features, uh, they have an obligation to add features as it makes sense for their customer base and so on. If you expect to quickly upgrade your client devices to 11AX, um, you could get a lot of benefit out of 11AX infrastructure. The, the, most inf enterprises upgrade infrastructure first and then clients get upgraded whenever they get upgraded. But if you have more control over your client base than that, and you can determine um, that uh, to upgrade to 11AX quickly on your client side, then 11AX infrastructure will be a big value. When should you wait? Well, if you have no budget, it goes without saying, if you have no budget, you have to wait. And if you've underutilized your 11AC network, it's still being supported. It's, it's um, you know, still working fine for you. You have plenty of uh, runway left. You know, uh, you have low utilization on the network. It's not that high density. Everything is working great. And you don't have any 11AX use cases in your network. Well, then wait. You're doing just fine just where you are. Um, certainly, if you... Uh, start to have 11AX use cases of high density or very high density, whether it be K-12 through or, or universities or large public venues, things like this that are early adoption scenarios, well, then you could adopt 11AX APs only in certain areas and then leave 11AC for the, the lower density, lower contention areas. If you are in the, the wait scenario, uh, for example, you're not currently uh, utilizing your 11AC to the fullest, you don't have any 11AX case, use cases, you may consider uh, upgrading your POE or other things, um, your CAT6A uh, cabling instead. So upgrading to CAT6A gives you solid copper, which is going to accommodate the POE+, plus, POE++, plus plus, that is .3AT and BT. Um, uh, better because it has lower resistance and you can transfer both data and power at longer distances. Uh, with the solid copper, it's not going to heat up as much. And so you can stretch the cable out, um, still not past the 100 meter. But of course, as we bring the power up to dot three BT in a lot of cases, we're pushing so much current that it heats up the cable and that heat causes more resistance, which shortens the, the maximum length that your cable can be. So the better quality cable you have, the longer distances you can reach. You might also, you know, again, consider upgrading your switches to provide better PoE. Uh, if you have 802.3 AT switches, that is uh, 30 watt budgets, you're probably going to be okay for most of the access points out there uh, that will be introduced. But once we get into the very high end 4x4s, four um, uh, 2 radio, and then certainly with 3 and 4 radio and the 8x8s, 
uh, you will want to upgrade your switches to the 802.3 BT PoE++ switches for sure. It'll be required. Uh, you might also consider better network management systems or upgraded uh, versions and upgraded controllers, analytics, uh, better onboarding systems for, uh, you know, for your guests and things like this, uh, upgraded or new, uh, the uh, NAC systems and even location solutions. So, you know, if, you're, if your Wi-Fi is already in good shape with 11AC and again, you don't have any 11AX use cases, there are a lot of things that you can consider to prep your network for uh, when 11AX uh, use cases come along for you. Again, with the cabling uh, and PoE re uh, requirements here, uh, 11AX is going to introduce some pretty high-end uh, power needs or power budget requirements. 4x4 APs are likely to operate within your uh, .3 AT PoE Plus budget, uh, 25 watts usable out of a 30 watt budget um, at the power sourcing equipment. But that's for two radio units. Once you get up into three or four radio units or you're using eight by eight, you're gonna need a much bigger budget. Uh, the class three BT, dot three BT is going to run about, um, 60 watt and then all the way up to about 90 watts with class four. And we expect some of these three radio and eight by eights to run as much as 45, even a little bit more than that, 45 to 50 watts. It's a lot of power. And of course, pulling that much power heats up the cable and you're going to start to want to consider cat six, a, um, or even dual cat six, a in your walls. So, um, that's a, a pretty important facet of implementing 11 AX. Well, this concludes video four, and uh, we appreciate you attending. If you have any uh, questions, be sure to send them our way.